and a reading from the Gospel of Matthew, the 21st chapter. When they had come near Jerusalem and had re reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, <laughs> saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Well, we continue with our sermon, and today I'm going to be preaching on uh, our processional gospel, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, and also the Philippians text, the second text that Deacon Jess read. But before I get to the sermon, I just wanted to say a few words. Uh, first off, uh, we had the funeral here yesterday for Frank DeBrito, uh, and it was a large funeral. We had over 450 people here yesterday, uh, and we had a lot of amazing people from our congregation helping out with that funeral. So um, I wanted to begin just with a word of gratitude for all of the people involved with the luncheon uh, and for all of the people helping to uh, put chairs out and uh, helping people to feel welcome in our congregation. It was... Um, just amazing to see all of uh, the members here at Christ the King band together uh, to make this funeral happen. So uh, thank you uh, to all of you for, for doing that. Um, also, I want to uh, welcome Pastor Tessa Moon Leeseth. If you could wave and say hello to everybody. She is our new interim pastor here, uh, and I am so thankful. We are so thankful that she is here. So uh, I hadn't met Pastor Tessa until a few weeks ago. But our paths have crossed in a lot of different ways. Um, so Pastor Tessa's in-laws, Patty and Keith Lee Seth, are from Buffalo, uh, my hometown, and I worked for them on a sheep farm. And so Pastor Tessa can attest to the fact that I really was a shepherd before I became uh, a pastor, pastor shepherd. Uh, I worked for them for uh, just a short time uh, when I was about 13, 14 years old. And... Uh, uh, her in-laws also built my parents' house that they still live in, which is amazing. And I've known her husband, John, for my whole life. In fact, I looked up to John, as, and I still do, uh, but especially as a kid. I, I remember we were over at their house for uh, supper one night, and John, this is probably 17 years old, and he had an Apple II GS computer in his room. And I thought that was the coolest thing. And I think we played Oregon Trail, which was which was a fun game uh, back in the day. So welcome uh, to Pastor Tessa. We are so happy that you are here. Um, she is an amazing person and an amazing pastor. So thank you for, for being here. So, um, so on to the sermon. Uh, one of the things that I do whenever I prepare a, a sermon is I read the text, the gospel text, line by line, and then I close my eyes and I try to insert myself into the gospel and try to imagine. I like to use my imagination, something Mr. Rogers taught me to do. Use your imagination. I try to imagine myself uh, in the place that the gospel story is all about. And so I did that with our processional text that we have for this morning. And so I went line by line and tried to imagine what it would be like to be a part of that crowd. And then I got to verse 9. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. 
And I started to think about and ask myself what that would have been like to have all of these crowds shouting and, and praising you. And I thought about what would that be like to be in a parade of sorts, uh, this procession, and have these crowds, thousands of people, uh, shouting and, and praising you. And then all of a sudden, I thought of an experience that I had had uh, a number of years ago when I was on my internship. So I wanted to start off with a fun story as a way to dive into this text uh, about processions and uh, on this Palm Sunday as Jesus is making his way in to Jerusalem. So my story is a bit more mundane, and it's kind of a goofy story, but uh, it is a story that uh, helps me re know what it's like to have people shouting at you and what that experience is like. So I did my internship in Sandwich, Illinois. There really is a Sandwich, Illinois, and we had all sorts of fun jokes about Sandwich. Whenever we would see a police officer driving down the street, we'd say, oh, there's the police officer. I'm speeding. I'm in a pickle now. Do you get it? Sandwich and pickles? Yeah, it's a terrible joke. So anyway, Sandwich uh, is John Deere country, right? John Deere tractor country. Moline, Illinois is just a few hours away. That is the home of John Deere. And Sandwich is also the home of the Sandwich County Fair. It's a really big deal there. It's one of the oldest county fairs in the country. And someone asked me if I would like to be in a tractor parade. And I said, I would love to be in a tractor parade. And so the tractor I got to drive was a DC case. And this is John Deere country, so DC cases are not looked at Highly, but that was the tractor that I got to drive. And so I drove out to a farm nearby, a few hours, or a few minutes away, I should say, a few miles away. Uh, I can't remember his last name, but his first name was Jerry. And the tractor was caked with all sorts of mud and other things. It was very, very dirty. And he said, Pastor, your first job, I was an intern then, intern Aaron, your first job is to pressure wash this tractor and wax it for me and then you can be in this tractor parade. You can use this tractor. And so that's what I did. I had the pressure washer out. I pressure washed it. I waxed it, got it gleaming, uh, bright orange, uh, just this beautiful tractor. And it had a, the kind of the steering rod down the side of the tractor for those of you that know what a DC case is. And so I got on the tractor and I drove it into town, into Sandwich to prepare for the Sandwich County Fair tractor parade, tractor processional, most of which uh, are John Deere's, um, just a handful of other tractors, and I was the handful of other tractors. So we uh, drove it into town, and it doesn't go very fast. I didn't know there was a road gear on this tractor, and so I was going very slow uh, into town, got all lined up in this tractor parade, and uh, I was right uh, in front of a John Deere Model A. Uh, kind of that makes the pop pop sound and so we're all lined up and we're going through the parade all throughout the uh, all throughout the big city the big metropolis of Sandwich uh, and about a third of the way into the parade suddenly my tractor dies and I can't get this thing started worth a darn and then the John Deere Model A comes up and says you know intern Aaron Sometimes you need to be pulled through life, and I'm going to pull you through this tractor parade. So he just happened to have a tow strap, and so he connected the tow strap to uh, my uh, DC case and connected it to his John Deere Model A. And so he starts to pull me through the rest of the parade, and the crowd went wild. <laughs> Thousands of people shouting, John Deere lives forever. Go John Deere, down with Case. And I'm waving at everybody. I'm dressed in bright orange shirt and I've got a Case hat. But I start waving and people started cheering. It was the coolest experience. But they were cheering uh, not necessarily because of the DC Case and my driving ability, but because of the fact that this DC Case was being pulled through the tractor parade by a John Deere Model A in the middle of John Deere country. 
So that is my one experience of knowing what it's like to have people shouting at you. And I don't know if it was really praising me or not, but it was quite a scene. And in the paper the next day, there was a picture of me, which I have somewhere in my files, a picture of me uh, waving at people and standing up on my DC case with the John Deere Model A pulling me through the parade with people shouting at me and praising the John Deere. It was kind of fun. So that just, uh, that image came to me as I was going through this processional gospel and I thought I would share that with you. So today, of course, is Palm Sunday, and it is the day that we remember that celebrated entry of Jesus into Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago. And we can imagine ourselves there and to think about what that was like. Jesus was gathering quite a following of people because he had performed so many miracles, healed so many people, and had spoken to people powerfully of God's love. And now Jesus and his disciples were making their way into Jerusalem for the Passover celebration, and the crowds had turned out because they had heard about this amazing healer and this incredible teacher. Despite the fact that he rode into town on the back of a humble donkey, they welcomed him by laying out their cloaks on the road for him and waved palm branches. Just imagine yourself there. Close your eyes if you have to. It must have been an incredible scene. Now palm branches were important because they signified peace and they were a way of welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem. And the crowds were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And quite literally, the crowds were saying, salvation comes from Jesus, the son of David. In the story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, there are a variety of responses to Jesus, and many asked, who is this? The, the gospel states, when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? That question, who is this? Who is this Jesus? is one we continue to ask. Starting today, we begin our Holy Week journey where we will learn more about who this Jesus is. If you read the last chapters of Matthew's Gospel throughout this week, you will see the supportive crowds quickly dwindle because he did not come in as a conquering hero, but rather as a humble servant on a donkey. We will see him celebrate his Last Supper with his disciples. We will see Jesus getting betrayed, being imprisoned, and then he will walk another road to his death on a cross. So let's ponder this question, who is this? Who is this man, Jesus? And to further consider this question, let's take a closer look at that Philippians text that we have for today. And Philippians is one of the tiny books towards the back of the Bible in the New Testament. All those short books with funny names are actually named after cities or individuals because these are all ancient letters written to a group of people in a city or an individual person. Philippians was a letter written to all the Christians who lived in the city called Philippi. In reading these letters from the Bible, allows us to eavesdrop on the lives of people who live shortly after the time of Jesus. And it is so incredibly fascinating to see that people back then had a lot of the same issues that we have today. Even though our technology is different, our modes of transportation are different, the food we eat is different, our sanitation systems are different, and the language we speak is different. We have a lot in common with these early folks in these letters. And just like the folks back then, we need to know who Jesus is in our lives. I think this letter to the Philippians could have been written to our modern church and to our modern families. There are so many things in this life that threaten our focus, 
And we all need to be reminded of how Christ became like us so that we can become like him. We get into fights sometimes. We forget to care for the needs of others because we want things our own way. We forget that in our families, we all need to pitch in and help out. We forget how to listen to one another, and we forget sometimes how to work together. We get off track, and we forget that we are all coming together to seek God and not our own interests. The words we heard in Philippians reminded them and us what is most important in this life. Philippians 2, uh, verses 5 through 11, are actually the words to an early Christian song called the Christ Hymn. And that hymn helps us to answer that question, who Jesus is. So let's hear these words one more time, and these are actually the words to a song. Let the same mind be in you that it was in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So have you ever heard song lyrics that spoke to your life situation perfectly? Sometimes a favorite band or music group can say the things in a way that is just right, way better than we could ever say it. Paul knew this song did a better job of saying what he wanted to say, and so he quoted it in this letter to the Philippians. It is a song about Jesus. It is a song about what Jesus did for us. And Paul wants the Philippian Christians to follow Jesus' example. So he quotes the song by saying that Jesus started out equal to God, but he emptied himself and became human. He gave up all the power he had to become a regular person, just like you and me. And he became a person whose sole mission in life was to serve others. He became the most humble person there ever was, and he ended up giving his life for us and dying on a cross. And because he humbled himself in this way, God raised him up and gave him all the heavenly power he started out with so that people everywhere would come to know him and people would come to worship him. This song is all about how giving up power and not being selfish was actually the way, was the path to becoming great. Paul quoted this song as a way of telling people who the real Jesus was the one that they needed to follow with their whole lives. He was saying, look to Jesus Christ. He is the example that all need to be following. A seminary professor of mine once said, if we want to become like Christ, we begin by hearing how Christ became like us. This Christ hymn can help us do that. It can help us to consider how we can become like Christ by hearing how Christ became like us. Perhaps the reading from Philippians, the Christ hymn, can be your devotional reading for this week as a way to answer that question, who this Jesus is. Or maybe you could find a favorite song that could guide you this week, that could guide your work of understanding that question, who is Jesus? A song that's been important for me over these last few weeks in my own devotional life is a song by the band Mumford and & Sons, and it's a song called Awake My Soul. And I'm going to give you the gift of not singing that song for you, because it would be way off key, but I'm going to share a few of the lyrics that are important, that, I, that I've been meditating on, I've been thinking about. And uh, first, it repeats three times, Awake my soul, 
Awake, my soul. Awake, my soul. And then they sing my favorite line of the whole song. In these bodies we will live. In these bodies we will die. Where you invest your love, you invest your life. In these bodies we will live. In these bodies we will die. Where you invest your love, you invest your life. So hearing these lyrics over these last few weeks has invited me to awake my soul each and every day by slowing down and considering how to invest my love. I have been thinking a lot about how easy it is to invest our love into the things of this world. But at the end of the day, that investment will not grow. As I have been on this Lenten journey, I have been realizing again and again about the importance of investing our love into this man, Jesus, who rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. By investing our love into Christ, who humbled himself for our sake, we are investing our life and our everything into him. And it's this love, Christ's love, that will pull us through life when we break down. God's love will pull us through and take care of us. And that investment, that investment of love into Christ can only happen because Jesus first invests his love into us. As we learned this week, Jesus loves us so much that he will take the road to Golgotha and go to die for our sake, to die for our sins. Jesus tows our sins to the cross. That, my friends, is the ultimate in love. As it is recorded in scripture, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for their friends. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious and amazing God, help us to know that you tow us through this life with your great love. Be with us during this holy week as we consider the question who Jesus, your son, is to us. Help us to keep our souls awake to how Jesus humbly rides into our lives to bring us healing and peace. And what good news this is for us. Amen.